Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Adam, or A Touch of Multiplatform. I'm Justin from TouchLab, and today we are talking with Philip Lochner, who has more YouTube subscribers than me. <laughs> that confession isn't awkward enough to kick <laughs> off this episode. Um, what would be really awkward, I think, uh, would be to use Vim instead of Android Studio as an IDE. Uh, when I was a full-time developer, I had an aversion to IDEs, so my unpopular tech setup was writing more scripts and installing more plugins to turn Vim into a bespoke IDE. Uh, I am here with my co-host, Pamela. Uh, won't you please introduce yourself and tell me about your unpopular tech setup? <laughs> Hi, Justin. Hi, folks. I'm Pamela Hill. I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains. And um, I am mortified, Justin, that you didn't support our IDEs. That is just so unacceptable. <laughs> um, but I, I have I, to admit... I did always like... Uh, <laughs> you always I did liked. always like IntelliJ more mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. more than Eclipse. <laughs> so my awkward confession is that I have so much stuff on my desk that there's only space for one monitor, and it's my laptop monitor. I have like a standing desk, and this thing is so big that if I elevate things, I I don't I don't have space for another monitor. I know you get those really other those uh, those land with the whole thing so the problem is that i'm quite tall you can't see it now but i'm quite tall so like i have to prop up my my standing desk uh, my laptop on top of my standing desk with this thick book and it's painting in the louvre so art is useful after all <laughs> okay art is always useful art is always useful but art is really useful to me every day <laughs> um so we've got a, a lovely guest here today it's philip luckner uh philip won't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you yes hello uh, i am philip and i make videos about android development on youtube that is probably why you introduced me here and invited me here and uh, i'm a very passionate lover of uh, your created uh, your, your created programming language kotlin that is what i want to say and I love making videos. I love teaching people, but I also love building apps. I am currently specialized on Android development with Kotlin, but I'm also um, very looking forward to the future, what we can do with Kotlin. Very cool. Uh, you do create a, a lot of content. I um, mean, you also keep it, maintain it, really great quality. How, how do you do that? Do you have productivity tips that you can share with our audience on how you get the most out of your day? Yes. Uh, so. I've read a few books about productivity and from what I've learned from these books is that these made me unproductive. <laughs> so um, I feel like I feel like most people already know what it takes to be productive, but they don't act on that. Um, so for me personally, what really helps me is to, to um, first of all, check what is my most productive time of the day. For me, that's the first two to three hours in the morning. And then I try to protect that time at all costs. So in, in that time, I don't check my TikTok feed. And in that time, I really focus on the most important task of the day or the most difficult one, which requires the most um, most amount of my concentration. And in this time, my, my girlfriend knows that uh, she shouldn't disturb me because I'm in flow mode. Um, I, I think that always does a lot. And if you, if you work the first three hours of your day really productively on an important task, then after that, you already feel great. And you also don't feel bad if you, if you take a break for an hour or so. Um, so that's really my kind of trick. But in the end, I think people know what they do. It's similar to, to living healthy. We all know what food uh, is good for us and what isn't, but we still like all these tasty foods and it's just hard to act on these things we already know. So I don't think uh, people are missing the, the fifth book on productivity, but rather um, yeah, to just kind of practice their discipline and sticking to the things they already know. That actually uh, reminds me of a book called 4,000 Weeks. I don't, if, don't know if you've read it, but it's like the anti-productivity book. And it's basically just saying you've got your life, if you live, if you're lucky and you live about 80 years or so, you've got 4,000 weeks to do stuff. And that's surprisingly little. Um, so what the book says is basically what you're saying is you've got to pick stuff and really like focus. Um, and there's never going to be enough time to do everything. So you've got to pick the stuff that's important. Um, 
Philip, on your YouTube landing page, you talk about your frustrations about with your experiences at university and your current ex frustrations with university education. Can you kind of summarize what your thoughts are in that regard and what you think needs to change? I think that's overall a very difficult topic, um, but I personally, so so I studied computer science, I have a bachelor's in uh, computer science, but on the other hand, I'm also kind of self-taught, so at least what I know about Android is completely self-taught, and most of my software development practices I, I learned over time are self-taught, and I think um, now I'm able to kind of compare these approaches. And I think in university, things would have needed to get more more practical. Um, that is what I what I really missed. Um, so I, I think it's, it can't be that students sit in a lecture and they constantly ask themselves, why am I learning this? And even if there is a purpose why, the, why they should learn that, then I feel like there is a lack of communication to, to tell them, hey, that is the reason, that is uh, how you could apply this theoretical piece of uh, knowledge later on in the real world. But if someone doesn't know why they learn something, then learning is just much more inefficient. That is that is one one thing what I would uh, what I kind of criticize at the current um, university system. On the other hand, I felt like things were often overcomplicated a lot. Um, so many professors I had were great and, and they did a really great great job teaching. But on the other hand, with many others, I felt like um, they they overcomplicated things because because they, they want to show off how smart they are. So that's not based on any, data, on any data, that's just my personal feeling I had back then. And I think if a, if a professor who, who mastered the field, who really knows pretty much it all, and then students come over to, to a student who makes YouTube videos and prefer watching that over the lectures, then I think something is wrong. And in regards to what, what they could do better, um, an approach would be that I think we would need to kind of, um, decrease the amount of time we teach the broad knowledge, so in the in the bachelor's degree, and increase the amount of time where people learn specialized knowledge. So I think everyone uh, who gets into tech needs some kind of foundation. I think everyone um, should know what a data structure is, but I don't know if everyone needs to know how to kind of traverse a graph, how to invert a binary tree, which we all learn in a bachelor's degree. I think we, we should get some kind of foundation for maybe one, 1.5 years, but then people get an impression of what kind of field they want to dive into. And after that, they could then just learn the, the um, knowledge and the technologies they really need for that. For example, if I say after 1.5 years, um, I want to become an Android developer, I want to become a mobile developer, then for me, what's much more important is to learn these software development principles than maybe diving into AI concepts, diving into algebra, because I don't need that that much in my job. And I think that would be a major improvement of the system as it is. So I've I've recognized that when I was in in school too. Like uh, I I ended up switching majors and went into uh, learning programming and databases and all that for for a master's degree. And it was having the flexibility of being able to choose the classes that in the direction that I wanted to go. Like you said, if someone wants to be an Android developer, they they really want to do that, then there's going to be certain things that they should be learning that they're not going to learn otherwise. I think it's a really good, really good thoughts you've had on this. I agree, but it's also difficult to decide what you want to do. Um, it's it's hard enough deciding, okay, I want to study computer science and then like finding a specialization is even harder. Um, so, I mean, I, I took a little bit of a, a journey through my years because mobile development wasn't a thing 20, 20 years back. Um, so, I mean, I, I did things for the desktop on the JVM and all kinds of strange like web stuff and electronic engineering stuff. So th th it's not always, your path isn't always clear. So it, it's difficult to pick something. But I agree with Philip, it would be nicer to have more exposure to a broad section and then a, a very specialized section if you if you know what you want to do. Do you think you, you need these three years in order to be able to pick something? Or do you think you could also um, get to know enough of the tech world to be able to decide that after, let's say, 1.5 years? I agree. It is definitely like you can, you can learn programming, like good programming uh, in one year of university, maybe two, and then 
you know decide on a on an extra specialization but i think i think universities stretch it a little bit and then they you start throwing in the maths or the uh like i had astronomy <laughs> and physics and um you start throwing in all kinds of languages and stuff and it just gets unnecessary very quickly do you um philip do you have any tips for like high school graduates that or wanting to go into tech. So this is kind of like, um, you know, having a clean slate approach, but they're not really sure what the best approach is. Would you say boot camps is a good idea or do you think university is still the best? I think there is no one way that fits all. Um, I think it's an individual problem and you need to ask yourself, I think it comes down to two to questions you need to ask yourself. On the one hand, um, do you already know what field to dive in, um, which we just talked about? So if you already know you want to be become a mobile developer and you know that before even um, starting to study, then I don't think it's necessary to actually go that path and you can fully focus on, on learning mobile development. Um, most people probably don't know that. Um, so another question I think you should ask yourself is, do you hate being told what to do or do you are you someone who, who needs some kind of structure from someone else? Um, if you, if you're just like me, who, who hates being told what to do, then um, I, I don't think you'll you'll be happy in university because they will tell you a lot of stuff you don't want to learn, or that's at least not the highest priority in your in your learning. And I I enjoy the time much more where I started to to learn Android, to just learn that by watching courses online, by um, just building some simple apps, just reading through docs, because I was interested in that, and nobody gave me that that, that structure. But if you're someone who says, OK, I, um, I don't have that kind of self-motivation, that internal drive to do something, um, which probably also many people um, will, will say about themselves, then I think university is actually a good approach. And especially if you don't know what you want to do yet, um, because I wouldn't say just uh, try out everything in tech. I think that will, that will take longer than actually uh, doing your bachelor's or so, after which you have quite a good impression of what's out there and what you can do as a software developer or as a computer scientist, rather. That, that quality of uh, not wanting to be told what to do, it probably makes you have a better like approach or a different approach to like training and, and helping others to figure out how to do things um, or attract an audience around that. Uh, and it definitely comes across in some of the opinions that you have. And I love that you're transparent about your opinions and where you see things are going right now versus maybe in the future. Uh, at the beginning of 2022, you explained in a video that you were disappointed in KMM, but you also saw promise in it. And then by the end of that year, you launched a course for it. Um, so like what happened in that year? Uh, so back then it, it looked as promising as it is, uh, as it still is. And I tried it out because it, of course, sounds cool to be able to, to build multi-platform apps in your favorite language. Um, so till then I only built Android apps and suddenly there was, um, kind of a solution that, that promised, Hey, you can now do the same for iOS. Um, and you don't need to learn much more than you already know. And that is why I tried it out back then. Um, but the thing is back then it was in alpha alpha usually kind of means, okay, things aren't really stable yet. And that is what I also experienced. Um, so I think back then it took me like a whole work day to get a Hello World app running um, because the, the challenge wasn't to, to connect these things, to um, write iOS code, to write Android code, have a shared module. The challenge was more to, to just get your Gradle setup right and to have the exact same uh, version combination that currently works for your specific hardware. And, and that made it a mess back then, um, which, which frustrated me, but I still saw that promise because obviously it was an alpha and that just means, hey, it, it, things will get better in future. Um, so I, I kept at it. And I think when it, um, when it got into beta, then I tried it again and it immediately compiled and built on my machine. So that was when I got more interested and actually started building apps. Making progress. I, I'm, I'm actually glad you said one, it took you one day and that was in, <laughs> that was not too long ago because not too long before that it would take people multiple days to get it to work. And not too long before that they pe companies would have hack weeks to like, Hey, let's try making column multi-platform work. So progress keeps happening. It does keep getting better. Um, and as progress continues, uh, a lot of the, those issues are getting solved and people are, have already asked questions that now have answers. What are some of the most frequent questions that you see people having nowadays about KMM? 
Uh, I think the most frequent question I get is people um, asking, do you really need a Mac to build iOS apps and Android apps? Um, and the answer is simply yes. If you want to build the iOS side as well, then you certainly need a Mac because that's an, not a limitation from KMM, but from Apple. Um, I think you should be able to build the Android side of things on a Windows machine, something I haven't tried out. Um, maybe you can confirm if you know that. Yes. Uh, so if you are maybe working in a KMM team and your job is just working on the Android side, then you can do that on a Windows machine. Another question that is a bit more technical, I got a lot for my um, course, or for, for at least for the first crash course I published on YouTube, um, is should you share your view models or not? I think that's a very commonly uh, discussed question in KMM. Um, I would say it's, it depends. In my uh, later on release course, I, I did that. I uh, came up with kind of my own approach of sharing view models because the issue here is that on Android, we typically use view models for a screen because um, there we have this Jetpack view model dependency, which just comes with additional stuff we um, that helps us in Android. For example, it offers a coroutine scope where that is directly scoped to the lifecycle of a view model. Um, it allows us to restore our state after process death. And these are things we usually don't need on iOS because iOS just works differently. And if we want to share our view model now um, with KMM, then we need to use a pure Kotlin approach so we can use any Android dependencies in it, which the Android view model would be. Um, so I kind of solve this approach by having um, an Android view model wrapper around my shared view model that creates a little bit of boilerplate code, but it, I, I found it's not really error prone boilerplate code. Um, so I went with it and I can actually share a big part of my state mapping logic, which is Kotlin only with the state flows uh, in, my, in my shared module. If you want to hear another one, uh, that would be um, how do you implement platform specific behavior, for example. So if you say, okay, you, you um, want to work with something very hardware specific, uh, then how do you do that? Because that works differently for iOS than it works for Android usually. Uh, and the answer to that is simply KMM allows us to define exactly these um, special cases independently for each platform. So for example, in my course, I work with the speech recognition API um, to yeah, just be able to, to say something and then uh, yeah, translate that into text in the app. And for that, we basically just implement the speech recognition API once for iOS and once for Android, and it will work just fine. I think my approach actually wouldn't even differ if it's um, KMM or another type of technology. I think on the one hand, courses are great to get started, I think, and to get your first kind of understanding how things are wired together. Um, but even though my, my, my channel has a lot of videos and I benefit a lot from people watching my videos, I always recommend people to build stuff. Um, I recommend people to actually watch a course, but then build something with, with what you've learned in that course. Um, so even if it's just a simple to-do app or note app at first, um, people always try to, to look for that new idea, which they just use for their learning projects. I don't think you need to, to find a special idea, just something that does something. And, and with that, you, you will encounter many more issues you, you haven't even thought at first and which you, which you wouldn't need to, to solve on your own if you just follow a course step by step, because the course is, of course, prepared over weeks and it's, it's just made in a way that you won't face any issues. But if you work on an app on your own, you will face a lot of issues and you will need to try to solve these on your own. And that in the end forms your experience with the technology. And I, I think it's the same with KMM as it is with any other kind of framework or technology. And it's also how you would, um, like, if you actually get a job doing Kotlin multi-platform, you would actually have to solve things by yourself on your own, in, on your own time. So there will be no instructor to help you. So it's definitely like, it's, it's building that sort of problem solving skill as well, which, which is really important is building your own apps and then problem solving those apps as, as well. In my experience, the, the actual best case scenario you could get into is having someone who's more advanced than you reviewing your code. So you still have that, um, you still work on your own apps, you still do your own mistakes, but you're um, guided and corrected much quicker. So that was, in my experience, the, the fastest approach to learning, but, but not everybody um, can easily find such a person. Yes, yes, especially with a new technology. Yeah. Call multi-platform. Uh, continuing to grow in popularity, but not been around as long as something like React Native. Um, and uh, Flutter definitely has a very large community uh, build, like making courses and building up sample apps around it. Uh, so you can talk to people. When, when you're thinking through like somebody's coming, like I want to make apps, 
I'm not sure about native. Maybe I should use this Kotlin, uh, Kotlin multi-platform or Flutter or PWAs. Uh, what do you think the main differences are from a, like a developer's perspective, but also an end user perspective that can help people make those choices? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I am everything but a cross-platform expert. So everything I, I say here is based on what I've heard from people and not from my actual practical experience. Um, so I think I've built a Node app in Flutter back then, but, but not more, more than that. Um, but from a developer perspective, I think um, as for now, the main difference is how you implement platform-specific APIs and the UI. Um, so currently in, in KMM, we need to implement the UI separately for iOS in Swift or Swift UI and for Android in Jetpack Compose XML. For platform specific APIs, it's the same, as I just mentioned with the speech recognition. So we need two implementations. Cross platform frameworks kind of try to still put that in one code base, um, which for the UI works. So you have the same UI for Android as you have on iOS because Flutter, for example, uses its own kind of drawing framework. But for platform specific, uh, platform specific APIs, I've heard that the, it can become a real pain to work with these, um, I think Flutter calls them plugins, um, which, which you need if you need to interact with the device hardware, like um, interact with a camera or so. And these are issues you don't have with KMM because you really work with a native code if you need to access such uh, platform specific APIs. And that is what these APIs were written for. Um, from, from an end user perspective, I, I think KMM apps will feel more native because in the end they are native. They use the, the native APIs, they use the, um, the native UI as well. So you will notice a difference if you see a native iOS, rep, iOS app compared with a native Android app, which has the same UI elements, but Apple just um, looks different than Android and users will, who, who use an iPhone also want it to feel like an iPhone. And with Flutter, you just, or not just Flutter, it's also PWAs and all the other um, cross-platform frameworks, of course, um, but with these, it will look the same on every single platform. And I think every platform just has their own char characteristics where the users also want to kind of um, also partly identify with these kind of characteristics. And then an iPhone user would not want to feel an iPhone app like an Android app on the other way around. So I think KMM has a really good approach of solving this problem while still minimizing the amount of code um, we need to write. Mm -hmm. So on, aside from your content creation, you also do some app development. Um, have you actually started using Kotlin multi-platform in those projects? Um, so. My app development here is not uh, some own apps I work on and publish. I, I only work on YouTube on the one hand, and on the other hand, I work as a freelancer for companies around the globe. And I actually recently started to, to work on a KMM project for a client of mine um, who, who had a big Java code base, super messy code base, and I want to migrate that to KMM code base um, because they also want to support um, multi-platform and iOS. So that is one platform I or one um, project I started working on with KMM also in the in the corporate world. Cloud multi-platform uh, is not the only new technology or relatively new technology um, on the mobile scene. And Android also has uh, Jetpack Compose. Um, now, I saw a very interesting Twitter thread recently asking whether folks are migrating their apps to Compose yet. And if not, why not? And a lot of them mentioned that they just don't see the business value there. Um, do you, you can talk about what you think about Compose from that angle, but also from Kotlin Multi-Platform's perspective, do you, do you think the same goes for that? So I think on the one hand, we need to ask ourselves what creates business value that is in the end just saving cost or earning money. That is what a company in the end cares about to or needs to care about in order to survive. That's just how it is. And if we if we take a look at Compose, then if you have a big code base and you want to, yeah, that, that is an XML, and you want to migrate that to Compose, then what needs to happen for that? You will have, have to have a ton of developers writing Compose code. And these developers, of course, cost money and time. So that rather creates cost to, to convert a code base to um, Compose. You can argue that in the long run, maybe a Jetpack Compose code base might be more maintainable, it might be um, faster to iterate on, but getting there takes a lot of time. So that is not an immediate result you get. And also on the other hand, does it earn a company any money? Um, no, not really, because the, the end user won't really notice a difference if you just change the UI framework, which um, where the UI looks exactly the same. If we take a look at Kotlin multi-platform, um, then I think things are a bit different because here I think that or migrating a code base to KMM creates actual business value because 
if you are able to have an Android app, a native Android app, and you can suddenly also support um, Apple and have an iOS app, then that allows you to, to have a much bigger user base. Or even if we take a look at, at KMP in general, not only KMM, then if you have a website, if you have um, a desktop app and all in you know, comparably small code base, then that creates business value because your users have much more, much more options to interact with your product. Um, so I think in this regard, it actually makes sense to migrate fast if you plan on um, extending, your, extending your project to multiple platforms. Yeah, that definitely reminds me of uh, companies and people that I've talked to. Uh, they definitely, like, when you have these two separate code bases, you get bugs that are happening in one versus the other, which some might argue, well, if you have a shared code base and then the bug happens on both at the same time, isn't that more of an issue, but no, because you can fix it in one place. Um, and then also from like the logic is, is logic slightly different on that one versus the other one. And you've got all these like gray areas of one team is implementing things slightly different. And then the user experience is different where you end up three stars on the app store and four stars on another, on the play store. <laughs> it's like, what's going on here? And some angry, some either angry iOS developers or some angry de <laughs> Android developers. Um, Philip, so uh, speaking awkwardly now of Compose multi-platform, have you managed to give it a try yet? What are your thoughts? I did, but uh, didn't spend a lot of time with it. Um, and my current feeling is similar to the feeling I had back then with KMN <laughs> when it was in alpha. Um, so that's probably also not uh, unfamiliar to you that um, we need to opt into a lot of experimental APIs in order to make Compose multi-platform work to also build um, iOS UI with Compose. But again, I, I think it's super promising and uh, I am aware that it's in a super early stage. I think if we really have the way to, to share the UI for all these platforms like web, um, desktop, Android, iOS, just with Compose UI and also share the other part of the code, then I think that's super promising for the future. And I think it will play a big role in the in, in deciding, uh, in making companies decide for Kotlin. And Compose. And whether to migrate yes. actually to Compose as well. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, having that across multiple platforms could definitely be a big thing. Because right now, like they've got JS on the web, and different flavors of JS TypeScript and all these other things, different languages people need to work with. And then uh, there are still some companies writing Objective-C for, for iOS, but a lot moving over to Swift. And then we had, a, what was it, 2017 that Kotlin became the official Android language. So people had to go from Java to, to, to Kotlin. Uh, how many of those languages, do you know more languages or all of those languages? Um, I've learned a few more languages, but for quite a while, I haven't worked with any others than Kotlin. Um, so I, I started back then, I think when I was 13 with Visual Basic, making Windows Forms applications and just dragging in your buttons. And uh, that was really cool. Uh, I learned a bit of C++. I learned Java in university. And for a long time, I built uh, games in Unity with C Sharp. That was uh, something I did in my, in my youth and uh, in my my school time where I then also made an Android game, by the way, a little um, jump and run game, a platform runner, and uh, then played that in a school break with my, with my friends. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, after being exposed to all of these, what, what makes Kotlin like feel good for you to develop in? What do you like about it? Mm, what I love about Kotlin are definitely extension functions. Um, they just make certain things feel so much more natural than needing to pass something as a parameter. Um, and what I really love, and I especially noticed that when I worked on my KMM course and the app I built there because there I was exposed to a different language, which is Swift, um, that is all the, the higher order functions we have in the standard library, like these functions to manipulate lists. Um, in Kotlin, we have map, filter, group by, flatten, all these things you, you need very often because in the end, we, we don't really need to write a loop anymore in Kotlin. Um, at least if we want to return something out of that loop, we don't really need any mutable lists inside of that loop because we can we can just work with these higher order functions. And, and that is what I really like. And I, I noticed that when I wrote some Swift code and I'm like, okay, we have map, but but what else? How, how can I do this? That's what I did in Kotlin. And uh, yeah, in there we, I think we often need to do things manually, which I noticed, but in Kotlin we have, we have so much core functionality already included in the standard library. 
actually lurk in an iOS developer's Slack. And sometimes there are people coming from Kotlin that are doing iOS development and they're like, I can do this in Kotlin. How do I do something like that in Swift? And it's like, well, you, you can't really. Um, are there some, like looking towards the future of Kotlin, are there some features from other languages or, that, or things that you know of that you would like to be brought into the language? Um, if we still compare Swift with Kotlin, then definitely using emojis and variable names. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, I'm not sure if there's a feature I, I wish Kotlin should have, which is not on the agenda. I think what is on the agenda, what I'm looking for is um, the ability to have um, a, a private property and then expose a different public one. So what we often have in, in Android and view models is that we have a private mutable state flow and we want to expose a public immutable one. And currently we need to create two fields for that. Um, but I think on the agenda is that uh, there is a solution for Kotlin so that we can still mutate the state flow in the view model, but expose an immutable one. That is one I'm look really looking forward to. And the context receivers. <laughs> yes, that's also a really nice feature. Um, Philip, in terms of like, so thank you for the shout out on, on the standard lib. Um, I hope that if you do after advent of code uh, this coming year, that you'll give Kotlin, the can Kotlin standard lib a try um, and maybe come on one of our streams to tell us about your solutions. But um, in terms of the third party libs that you like and tools for Kotlin multi-platform, can you give any shout outs to anyone or any company that that's doing open source stuff for Kotlin multi-platform? I think there are some some standard libs you really won't get around. Um, if you do networking, you will need Kato Client probably as for now. I'm not sure if there's an alternative right now. Um, if you implement a database, you will need something like SQL Delight or Realm. Um, but a, a non-standard set of libraries I encountered and I work with is uh, MoCo. Uh, I think it stands for Modern Kotlin. Um, and what I use it for or recently got into is uh, sharing resources because very often you have, for example, a set of strings you want to display on both iOS and Android. So why would you need these two kind of pieces of strings? If you need to change one, then you need to change them two places. So why not share them? Um, by default, it's a bit difficult to do that because retrieving such a localized string is, uh, works different on Android than it does on iOS. But this library kind of comes with a solution to, to do that in the shared code section. And the same for drawable resources and similar things. Yeah, sharing resources does come up a lot. And I know there's there's various third-party libraries for logging and other different parts, QR codes, like there's the community continues to to build more and more uh, to support developers that are coming into call multi-platform trying to scale it. Um, one aspect that uh, also comes up is around testing call multi-platform shared code. Should I only test it on Android and then it's magically going to, everything's going to work on iOS. Um, how can I test the shared code on iOS if I need to do that? And I saw that your course includes a, a KMM testing guide. So I'm wondering how does the testing approach that you, like an Android developer, how does the, the approach change when they're going into KMM and sharing that code with iOS? So you can simply put your um, shared unit test for your business logic in the shared module. So these will just be uh, normal unit tests. The the difference is that you can't use things like JUnit, um, things like the um, like Java assertions or so, which we uh, sometimes use in Android or so, sometimes know in Android. Um, instead, there is a Kotlin testing framework, which is very similar to JUnit, actually. So you won't really need to learn a lot more. And also Kotlin assertion libraries, I used assertk, which I really like because it um, felt so familiar, familiar to uh, Truth, which I used before for Android. And yeah, that's in the end what changes because if you test your shared code at a single place and both apps use that, then you already covered both, both use cases. What differs is, of course, if you have um, tests for platform specific things, like if you need UI tests, for example, as for now, then right now you will need to have two of these tests. So one UI test for iOS and one for Android, because the UI is, of course, you don't have one code base for the UI. So you, have, uh, you also need to have two tests. Or also, if you, if you test something in a, in a class that uses platform specific APIs, then that would also need to go um, into the uh, platform specific packages or modules. As um, as JetBrain starts to get into the stabilization phase of uh, Cotton Multiplatform, what do you what do you hope for? For uh, it will be somewhere 
hopefully in 2023, I, I think. So what do you think is the most, most important for us to focus on? What would you really like to see? I think at the moment it's to really compose multi-platform. That is where I see the biggest potential. Um, because as I already said, if you can, if you can have a, a, web, a website, um, two mobile apps and a desktop app all in one code base or with just a minimum amount of effort for, or for single platforms, then I think that's insane. Um, that, that's really good because um, I remember back then, like two or three years ago, people were started talking about PWAs. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know that, just progressive web apps, basically websites you can save to your phone. And um, when you were talking about that to be the big next thing, and they are a thing, um, but they still have the same issues we have with cross-platform frameworks that if we need to interact with a device's hardware, um, then, then that is hard. Um, and I think if we can now build a website and then get two apps in addition to that, which also PWA gives us, but those are native apps, then I think that's a really big advantage over all these um, other comparable technologies like Flutter, PWAs, uh, things like that. Amazing. Right, folks, it's really the end of our podcast. We were sad to let Philip go, but we must. Um, folks, it's uh, been great having you here. Philip, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for um, you know sharing your wisdom with us and uh, just being our little, little star for the day. Uh, thank you, Justin, as well. And goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone.